Just listen. Great song. Think about the words. Amazing love. You are my king. Worship with us. Let's I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted.
for this opportunity to worship you. And may we truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Of course, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good to see you today. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. Yes. Well, yesterday is my birthday. My wife took me to the beef house. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been to the beef house, but I can guarantee you I'm going back. Oh, my watermelon and cantaloupe and salad and rolls. Oh, yeah, I don't need to say any more, right? The rolls and then the steak, and it was... Can we just load a bus up and go right now? <laughs> Y'all hear a motion and we load a bus up and go right now. Too bad. Too bad. The 20 ounce ribeye. You don't have to tell on me now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought it was all you can eat, and so I ate all that I could eat. So anyway. uh, yeah, it was fantastic. But uh, thank the Lord for another year of life. Thank the Lord that I have the opportunity to serve here as pastor of this church. Thankful for you. And uh, this past Thursday, I believe it was Thursday or Friday, I could not have been more proud of Dr. John MacArthur. I don't know if you saw the blog on Facebook. Dr. John MacArthur is iconic in evangelical circles. I have his commentary on the entire Bible sitting on my desk. One of the members here gave me that uh, a couple of years ago. But Dr. MacArthur is, uh, he is, world-renowned as a theologian. He's a pastor. He's been pastor of that church out there in California, I don't know, maybe 50 years or so, 40, 50 years. But uh, I loved his blog about Jesus Christ is the head of the church, not Caesar. I loved it. And it's a little lengthy. And if you haven't read it, I encourage you to go on Facebook and, and read that. And basically what Dr. MacArthur is saying to the governor out there, no more, no more, no more. You know, churches across America, with some exceptions, closed down during the pandemic, the overwhelming majority, because we uh, didn't understand the severity of the virus. Uh, we didn't, there were a lot of unanswered questions back in, in March, and we believed that wisdom dictated that we not meet for a specified period of time. But as I've stated, as the weeks went on, the months went on, I became increasingly concerned and convicted about that and, and determined that we needed to set an end date and say whether or not there's a mandate we're going to meet together because the Word of God says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, you'll remember uh, we planned on going against the mandate if necessary but I wanted you to pray about it. Remember that because I, my preference was that we'd not have to go against the mandate. So from the top of that building, thank the Lord I'm not up there today, but from the top of that building, I asked this congregation to pray that the mandate would be dropped. And um, my wife and I headed west and we were in Utah eating dinner when I received news that week, just a few days later, that the mandate had been dropped and so I was, I was very thankful for that that we did not have to go against the mandate but I was willing to do so and I believed it was the right thing to do I was 100% convinced of that I uh, spoke with the deacons to get their input we were all on board together with that but uh, what's happening out in California right now it's tragic but thank God that Dr. MacArthur is saying we're opening our church no more no more Governor Newsom and we need to pray for what's going on out there as churches are once again Closing. So pray for Dr. MacArthur, pray for his church, which is a very sizable church, a very sizable church out in California. And just pray about this whole situation in general, the virus, pray that it will subside. It's hard to understand what to believe anymore. It's just very frustrating, but let's just pray that, that this will subside so that uh, God's people can, can meet together without... Uh, concern about a virus or concern about government interference. Very important that that, that, that happen, and I, I trust that you'll be praying about that. Continue to pray for Bill Everhart. Uh, still concerns about cancer. The biopsy came back that uh, it was cancerous, so please pray for uh, Bill, although he's doing well. He's feeling well and very thankful for that. Continue to pray for Tom Cooper. Tom Cooper is undergoing uh, a regimen from a holistic doctor. Pray that uh, that will go well. He's been sickly for quite some time. 
Now, these are a couple of requests I wanted to mention. I'm sure there are others. I've asked uh, Brother Kim Prommel to pray today. I want everyone to know that Brother Kim Prommel is the unofficial deacon of Bible Baptist Church. We've wanted him to serve as a deacon. People have nominated him, and he has wanted to serve for years, but his job would not allow him, does not allow him to serve as a deacon. He can't come to those glorious, gloriously, wonderfully entertaining yes. two to three hour meetings that we have every month here at the church. So uh, hopefully that'll change one day, but certainly we love Brother Kim. We appreciate all the work that he does here in our church and the blessing he's been to me and to our congregation. So he's not an official deacon, but he's an unofficial deacon. Is that okay, Chairman, that we call him unofficial? <laughs> chairman said it's okay, so we're going to. We're going to go with that. Yes. yes. There so uh, I'm going to ask him to pray, and then I have an important announcement. Okay. If nominated, I will not run, and if elected, I will not serve. <laughs> if that phrase from somebody, uh, it, it would be an honor to serve. I look forward to the day when that can be the case. I look forward to that day. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, sir. Well, let's pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we Thanks for this time together. Thanks for the sunshiny weather outside. Just for the way that that uh, boosts our frame of mind and our spirits yes. in general. We thank for this very opportunity to be in your house this morning, Lord. And uh, despite the chaos in the streets uh, around our country, we are glad to be in a, peace, a place with peace and joy and, and just the knowledge that you are in control. And uh, despite the uncertainty of this virus and all the decisions and, and things that are going on with that, we. We take comfort in the certainty of your sovereignty and your power and your grace. Yes. And we, we just hope we never take that for granted. We do ask that you give us requests that were mentioned this morning, Lord. Think of uh, Bill Everhart, this uh, cancer that he's dealing with, ways to guide the doctor's hands, help him to know what to do, how to treat, how to get him back to full strength and health, and uh, be a peril to other family members as well as yes. supporting him and our concern for him. I would think especially of Tom Cooper in this this long ongoing ailments of just some unknown origin and unknown treatment and so many unknowns that just uh, make it very difficult to, we just admire his endurance, his tenacity, his faith in you and, and Susie as well has just been a, a rock through all this. We pray she continue to strengthen her as she cares for him and give her the ongoing faith and strength to do so as these uh, new course of treatment goes on, that it would be effective that you get him back to full strength and health, get him back in church, Lord, we so glad to see him here. We do appreciate you being missed to our service this morning, Lord. Help us to set aside the distractions that would draw us away from your word. Yes. And just focus on what you have for us here today. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Kim. I meant to have you stand, so why don't you stand, stretch your legs a few minutes. We will be returning to somewhat to normalcy next Sunday, not complete normalcy in our service. Uh, is it ever normal around here? I don't know. But we're going to be returning to some sense of, of normalcy next week. We're going to start having congregational singing again, okay? I can't take it any longer, folks. I just can't. And, and do you know it's a command in Scripture that we sing to our God? Why do so many of us not do that? We need to think about that. This is not optional. We are to sing to our God. So... Uh, I, I love to sing and play the piano. I love music, but more than anything else, I love congregational singing because that's what I see in Scripture. Now, I want to say this. If you're concerned about singing, just bring a mask. Just put it on during that time. If you're concerned about the virus during this time. And let me just make this general statement about masks. I know when we go somewhere, and if you go somewhere and everyone's wearing a mask, and you feel like you should. If you come here and most people have chosen not to wear masks and so you might feel like well I don't want to be the odd person out and I don't want you to feel that way I want you if you if you feel that you should wear a mask I want you to wear one okay and I don't want anyone staying home next week well if we're going to start singing down there I'm, I'm just not going to go no 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 just just come and if you're concerned during that time you feel that wearing a mask might be helpful to you just please come. And you put the mask on, and believe me, I'm totally supportive of anyone who feels they should, should wear a mask, okay? We have some that, that wear masks in the congregation, and we may have more as we start congregational singing, at least during that time. It's okay. I want you to do what you feel is best, what you feel is safest for you, and uh, I'm totally supportive of that, okay? But we will start 
next Sunday with congregational singing, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I've, I've never done this many solos in my life, uh, so I, I, I want to hear you singing, I, not simply myself, I want to hear you singing, and so we'll start that next week. Please be seated, and I found out um, about something last week, and I'm like a kid in a toy store here that I can find, here we go, all right, I found out, I was informed last week that I can actually control my PowerPoint presentation with my phone. Everybody say, ooh. <laughs> so let's see what happens here. Let's see what happens. Uh, whoa, check that out. Isn't that cool? Okay, so uh, we're going to do that this week, and I believe that will be very helpful going forward. And uh, who knows, these phones, I'll tell you, it's getting a little bit scary, isn't it? Are they going to be able to cook our breakfast before it's over with? I don't know. That would be nice, wouldn't it? That would be real nice. But uh, I want you to take your Bible today and turn to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, please. Exodus chapter 32. And I, I want everyone to understand that in the next couple of months, I'm really going to be emphasizing revival leading up to the great event in Washington, D.C., Call the return, which is happening the weekend, September the 26th, September 27th. So I'll be showing little brief videos. I know the, the one I've shown the last several weeks is a little lengthy, but I'll be showing some brief videos. Uh, I do want to encourage you, if you're able to go, we're not taking a group per se. Uh, we're not taking a charter bus. But if you'd like to go, I would love to see God's people just flood Washington, D.C. that weekend, because that weekend is really all about revival. It's all about prayer, calling God's people uh, to repent, to turn back to God. And certainly that has to happen. That, ha that has to happen where our nation is going. So if you can go, I encourage you uh, to go. Also, the trip next summer. Now, it looks like we are at full capacity concerning the trip for next summer. It's, we have actually more people now who are wanting to go so we have over about 51 people right now who are interested in going and, and uh, the bus seats about 55 we're gonna have to leave some seats open for various reasons so that trip will be a church uh, trip we'll go together but this coming september in a couple of months if you want to go you need to take care of your own travel arrangements and your own motel accommodations and so forth but i'd love to see you there i plan on going Tyson is going with me. Tyson's absent today. Appreciate Dan Maxwell taking care of the live stream. I want to say hi to everybody who's watching via the live stream. Uh, but uh, I appreciate Tyson his work with that. So he's going to go with me and live stream, and hopefully we're going to be able to live stream into the service here on Sunday. I also have Don Estep coming as well. He'll bring a full message, but I will also be talking to you via a live stream. And we'll be having a special prayer that day on, I believe it's September the 27th. I, I believe Saturday's the 26th. So I'm just going to show you a very brief video, and then we'll launch into the message. This is our wake-up call. Now is the time for repentance. Time to turn back to God. Which leads to reconciliation with God and with each other. Bringing about restoration, a healing of our relationships, and our land. Then revival. A move of God like we've never seen before. A God-led reformation. The Return, September 26, 2020. Go to thereturn.org. So once again, I hope that you're able to attend that event. And uh, once again, I plan on going myself. Today, I want to talk to you about God's man in the midst of a wicked generation. God's man in the midst of a wicked generation. So I was debating whether or not to do something up until about three seconds ago. <laughs> believe it or not, there is some spontaneity in your pastor. I believe in uh, preparation all that, but also believe in spontaneity and being led by, by God's Spirit. So um, one of our members gave something out this morning. I think some of you received this, but it makes so much sense concerning the nonsense that's going on in our culture. So I'm gonna take this a few minutes and read this before I actually go into the message. And this is not from me, this is from one of our members. They saw this and it had an impact on them and, and so they gave it out in the classes, I believe, before uh, 
uh, before the classes began this morning, live group in Sunday school. Here it goes. I'm so confused right now. I see signs all over saying Black Lives Matter. I'm just trying to figure out which Black Lives Matter. It can't be the unborn black babies. They are destroyed without a second thought. It's not black cops. They don't seem to matter. It's not my black conservative friends. They are told to shut up if they know what's best for them by their black counterparts. It's not black business owners. Their property does not mean anything. It's not blacks who fought in the military. Their statues are destroyed by the Black Lives Matter protesters with disdain. So which Black Lives Matter again? Black Lives Matter, of course they do. Then when the multitude, I'm sorry, then when multiple black police officers and individuals were killed during the peaceful protest, I don't see any outrage. Black individually owned businesses burned to the ground, silence. Deadliest weekend in Chicago, nothing. I can't keep up, I just can't. I'm exhausted trying to figure out what we're all supposed to do, believe and be offended and outraged by next. Two months ago, first responders were all the rage. In fact, they were the heroes. We gave them free coffee, meals, and cheers as they drove by. Today, we hate them and want them defunded because they can't be trusted. Two months ago, truck drivers were the heroes as well for keeping America moving and the grocery stores stocked. Today, we block the roads with protesters, drag them out of the cabs, and beat them half to death. Nurses and doctors are still cool for now. But they may be unemployed. They too are heroes, unless, of course, they truly believe all lives matter. Then they're filled with hate and are part of problem, uh, the problem like so many others. Just 45 days ago, protests were not essential and were considered criminal, selfish, and a murderous activity. Today, they are gloriously critical and celebrated. All of the obvious criminal and murderous activities are simply ignored. If you protest about lockdowns for freedom, you are selfish and you will spread a virus. If you protest, loot, and riot for social justice, you are a warrior and the virus fades to the background. Trust the experts. No, not those experts. Don't wear a mask. Wear a mask, but only good ones. Wait, don't wear a mask. Wear anything as a mask. Never mind on the mask. Not sure, but if you don't, you hate people because you could be an asymptomatic spreader. Wait, there's not such a thing anymore. For three months, nothing was more important than social distancing. In fact, we gave up all of our liberties for it. We canceled schools, medical and dental procedures, yet allowed the murder of babies, canceled activities, closed businesses, eliminated every spring rite of passage from prom to graduation, denied people funerals, even in Arlington, and we wrecked the economy for it. Then came social justice and social distancing was no more. Now things are more cut and dried though. A thousand people, at three memorials for someone they never even met. It's a matter of respect, but you can only assemble a hundred or less people. I'm really confused now. Look at the data. No, not the data. Do the math. No, you can't do the math like that. Only the experts can understand the data and math. What do you mean other cities, states, governors are in interpreting the data differently? Pools are safe in Indiana, but they're not safe in Michigan. Playgrounds are safe in your town, but not mine. Amusement parks are safe in Florida, but not Ohio nor Michigan. If you are silent, you are part of the problem. If you speak, you are part of the problem. If you have to ask, you don't understand. If you don't ask, you don't care. It's all so predictable, tedious, and exhausting. Nothing adds up. It's one gigantic math life problem with ever-changing denominators that I'm sure the media and politicians are eagerly ready to solve for us until the next crisis. So for now, I pray, I pray God will heal our land and bless the United States of America, bless us with wisdom, with kindness, with gentleness, with mercy, with love, with peace and healing, things that really do matter because we all matter in God's eyes. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. And that shows yes. I, take, I, I can't take credit for that. I don't know who actually penned those words, but it shows you how upside down things are in our culture right now, right? So we're gonna be talking a lot about revival moving towards September the 26th. And folks, we have to stop simply saying revival needs to come. Every one of us have said that. We have to stop simply saying revival needs to come. 
And we have to start sacrificing. There has to be some things that we're willing to do other than simply say revival needs to come. Because it's not going to come by us simply saying revival needs to come. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. So I'm going to be saying some things very pointed today. You know, a few weeks ago, it was about what's going on in the country. But, but today is more about what's going on in the body of Christ, even in our church. Everyone needs to evaluate himself or herself, including this pastor. When I'm pointing at you, please remember, several fingers pointing right back at me, right? So I'm not preaching at you or down to you. All of us in this room need to hear what I'm going to say today. But it will be a little strong as we move through the message, and you will see that. We desperately need revival. Now, the biblical event that we're looking at today is not that far removed from our first century America. We live in a nation that has perverted God's laws. We live in a nation that no longer knows the difference between right and wrong. We live in a nation that now calls evil good and good evil. To show you how mixed up things are, if you drive over to my home, I live very close to Walmart. Most of you know where I live. And so if you drive into my driveway and look up to the left in the rain gutter, there's this huge bird nest, okay? So it's really high up there. We have a two-story home, and I was trying to figure out how I could get to that without leaning on the rain gutter and, and bending the rain gutter and that type of thing. So I actually called someone in the area this past week about... Uh, just to get some information, didn't think I would probably go that way because of cost, but I wanted to get some information about uh, possibly removing the bird nest. Well, guess what the pastor found out? The pastor found out that in all likelihood, those birds are protected and that I have to get a permit. What's the deal with geese around here? Now, they're not geese, but I just, uh, what's the deal with geese? Okay. <laughs> what is the deal? Brother Ed, we live up there. We, I know the geese are everywhere. I, I don't know. I know I have a bad attitude. I, I understand. But I, I just don't. I don't. But you know, geese are protected, right? Did you know that they're federally protected? And my wife and I, we walk quite a bit. My wife and I, we religiously walk together. And so we have to maneuver around the geese and around what's left behind. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not going to elaborate. It can be a messy situation, but nevertheless, we have to maneuver around the geese and what they leave behind. And, and, and by the way, Jim Long, Jim Long has a really good story about geese that happened years ago. I'm, I'm not going to tell you. I'll let him tell you. But uh, it's hilarious to hear the story. I'm sure it wasn't hilarious to experience. <laughs> oh, oh, he was waiting for that. Wow, wow. I told him I might talk about this today. So. Anyway, beware. So my wife and I, we have to maneuver around those geese, right? And sometimes uh, one of those geese will look at you and kind of hiss, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> now, I, 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 I know this sounds a little out of the box here, but my wife and I, we were walking beside uh, one of those geese that was hissing the other day, and I'm almost positive, I'm almost certain that I heard these words, I'm protected what you gonna do. I'm protected what you gonna do. I'm convinced those geese know that they're protected, right? But you know, folks, we laugh about this, but isn't it sad, isn't it tragic that in the United States of America, geese or even birds in a nest on my home are protected, but babies in the womb are not? That is tragic and that is sick. It is sick. But that's exactly where we are today in the United States of America. Good has become evil. Evil has become good. Right has become wrong. Wrong has become right. We're all mixed up. As I read just a moment ago, we're all mixed up. All right. Now, you may say, has it ever been like this? Well, yes, if you look through history. There was a time when God had to send a flood because of exceeding wickedness, right? So we know that this is not something simply for this day and time. But wickedness seems to prevail because of, of the nature of man's heart without God. Throughout history, we've seen this iniquity abounding, and we're seeing it today. Now, in the account that we're going to look at, Moses, he's been on the mountain. He's receiving instructions from God. At the base of the mountain, you have the Israelites. And the Israelites uh, called for a golden calf. They wanted to worship a golden calf because they remembered the bull worship in Egypt. And they enlisted. This is hard for me to understand, but they enlisted Aaron, the brother of Moses, the right-hand man, 
of Moses to actually help them and assist them in the construction, the formation of this golden calf. What was he thinking? What in the world was he thinking? And so you have this golden calf, and the children of Israel began, not all of them, but many of them began to worship this golden calf. Moses discovers this. The Lord informs him of what's going on, and he's absolutely enraged. And so he actually confronts the children of Israel, and we're going to look at some things that he said to them today, okay? Father, I pray you'll take this message, use it for your honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Take your Bible and look at chapter 32 and verse 26. Chapter 32 and verse 26. The scripture reads, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? That's a question that pastors across the country need to be asking. Who is on the Lord's side? We need our pulpits to be hot in this day and time. Men proclaiming the truth of God's word without apology. And pastors need to be asking people who's on the Lord's side. We need to identify ourselves with our God, the true and the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know several things about God. We know that he always calls those who know him to identify publicly with him as we do today through baptism and as we do through the testimony of God's grace in our lives. So when someone puts their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, here's what I say to them. I tell them you need to be baptized. I instruct them as to why they need to be baptized. It's the first step of obedience in the Christian life. And when someone is baptized, it's very symbolic. When someone is standing in this baptismal pool, they are standing in an upright position. Christ, when he was crucified, he was hanging in an upright position. When someone is put under the water, that pictures the burial of Christ. And when they come out of the water, that pictures the resurrection of Christ. And what someone is saying symbolically, they are saying, I'm dying to the old life, and I'm going to live a new life for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm identifying myself with Christ. I'm not ashamed of Christ. I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It's public identification. But can I say to you that this identification has to extend beyond the four walls of a church building? This identification with God, with the Lord Jesus Christ, it has to extend beyond a baptismal ceremony. People today need to know that we belong to God. And I'm not talking about being caustic. I'm not talking about being pharisaical. I'm not talking about being holier than thou and looking down our noses on other people and thinking that we are superior. I'm not talking about that at all because that's not what God wants us to do. But on the other hand, we must stand tall for our God. And God makes it clear that if we are ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of us. Now, as you look through scripture, you see individuals who were willing to publicly identify with God, even though they were in the minority. You know, I think about the prophet Elijah, and the prophet Elijah went up against the prophets of Baal, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, also verses 38 through 40. And so Elijah, he's going up against 450 prophets of Baal. We don't like to be in the minority, right? Even with the mass thing or anything else, people attend a church. If everyone's a different color, they feel, you know, I feel a little awkward, a little strange, whatever it may be. Uh, so Elijah, think about this. Elijah is standing tall for God, but he's going against 450 prophets of Baal. They're worshiping this false God, this fertility God who was thought to bring life to the land. And Elijah says, we're going to see who's serving the true God. You know the account. I love this account. One of my favorite accounts in the Old Testament. So Elijah says, we're going to see who's serving the true and the living God. Because we're going to place a sacrifice on an altar. And we're going to call upon our God to answer from heaven by fire. And the God who answers from heaven by fire and consumes the sacrifice. Well, that's going to be the true and the living God. And so Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, you go first. And so they set up the altar. They place their sacrifice on the altar. They begin crying out to their God, the false god Baal. Nothing's happening. The Bible even says they leap up on top of the altar. Nothing is happening. This goes on throughout the day. Elijah begins to mock them. He begins to say, maybe your God is sleeping. Maybe he's distracted. Maybe he's talking to people. Maybe he's taking a journey right now. He's mocking them. And they begin to cut themselves crying out in desperation for Baal to send fire and consume the sacrifice to no avail goes on all day long. Finally, it's Elijah's turn. 
taking a little bit of dramatic license here, I can just see Elijah saying, stand back and let me show you how it's done. So Elijah sets up that altar with 12 stones. He places the sacrifice on top of that altar. There's a trench that's dug around the altar. And then he says, bring me four barrels of water. Four barrels of water are brought, poured on top of the altar, poured on top of the sacrifice of the altar, drenching the sacrifice, drenching the, the altar, and then water falls down into that trench around the altar. Then he says, bring me four more barrels. Four more barrels are brought, and that's poured out on top of the, the, the altar and the sacrifice, running down into the trench. And then he says, bring me four more barrels of water. So now we're talking 12 barrels of water poured, <clears throat> excuse me, poured on top of the sacrifice, poured on top of the altar, and now it fills up the trench around the altar. And then Elijah, you know the account. I love this, Elijah. He stands back, and in so many words, he says, Great God of Elijah, great God of Abraham, Isaac, great God of Israel, show yourself strong. God sends down fire, consumes the sacrifice, even licking up the water and the trench around the altar. God gave a great victory that day to the prophet Elijah, but on that day, the prophet Elijah stood tall, for God going up against 450 prophets of Baal. And here's the rest of the story, including many of God's people who were wrapped up in Baal worship. He's taking a strong stand for his God. Let me ask you a question. People who associate with you throughout the week, do they know that you're a Christian? See, I'm not saying if we identify ourselves with God, something that dramatic is going to happen in our lives, such as what happened with Elijah. I'm not saying that today, but I am saying that God expects all of us to proudly identify ourselves with him. So are we doing that? Are we undercover Christians? I'm afraid that for many, many Christians, their Christianity is a Sunday morning thing. You know, they do the God thing on Sunday morning, but then the rest of the week, people who associate with them would have absolutely no idea that they identify with God, that they call themselves Christians. Do people know that you're a Christian? Do people know that? If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you in a court of law? Think about that. People need to know that we belong to God, that we believe in the true and the living God, that we have a relationship with this true and living God through his son, Jesus Christ. So are we ashamed? So let's just talk about some things practically. Now I want to preface what I'm about to say by saying that there's no command in scripture, thou shalt pray before every meal, thou shalt pray before a meal, especially if you're in a restaurant. There's nothing in the Bible like Okay, so I want you to understand where I'm coming from with this. I'm not coming from the angle of you must do this in order to be right with God. I'm not coming from that angle. But hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. There are many of God's people who are afraid to pray in a restaurant before a meal because they're afraid that someone's going to look at them and think they're strange. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Pastor, does this really happen? Yeah, I was in a ministry one time. I had a Saturday morning men's prayer breakfast. So we would go to a restaurant. I cleared this with a manager. I talked to the manager, told him what we wanted to do. It was a buffet place, buffet breakfast. And I told him that we would like to eat and then have the tables cleared. And then we would like to have a prayer meeting. And so normally he would give us a table over to the side. They didn't have side rooms, but it was over to the side. So we were not distracting in any way. And we would eat, the tables would be cleared, and then we would have a prayer meeting right there. And I, I told the manager that uh, we would keep it within a certain time frame because it was a very busy restaurant. I wanted to be respectful of, of that, uh, the fact that they needed those tables and so forth. And so I cleared everything with the manager. He said, no problem, okay? So we're having this monthly prayer breakfast with men. And so we eat and we, we go around the tables and we pray together. And someone came to a particular prayer uh, uh, that we prayer meeting that we had on a Saturday who had not been at one of the previous prayer meetings and so after the prayer meeting he said can I talk to you privately and he talked to me privately and he said pastor I don't really like what we did today and I, I'm like what's he talking about is he talking about eating I know he's not talking about eating because Baptists love to eat right he can't be talking about that 
Is that what he mean, means? And then I thought, does he mean prayer? Is he talking about prayer? He said, I feel like we were a public spectacle, and I feel like we were casting our pearls before swine. Now listen, <laughs> I was gracious with the individual, but I have to admit, I have to admit that when he said that to me, immediately I thought, you're just, you're just ashamed of someone else seeing you pray. Now, I hope that's not the case, but that's the immediate thought that I had. Now, ladies and gentlemen, is that descriptive of anyone in this room? You know, a lot of God's people are even ashamed to pray around other Christians. Hello? Hello? If we're ashamed to pray around other Christians, I don't know what to think about that. I don't know what to say. Well, you know, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to put my words together. And listen, we're not... We're not trying to impress. That's not the purpose of prayer. We're talking. We're having a conversation with the true and the living God. If I'm simply trying to impress you with my words, that's the wrong motivation in the first place. It's about having a conversation with God. Well, Pastor, I'm not ashamed of God. I'm not ashamed of God. You know, I think of Peter. Remember Peter? Remember what Peter told the Lord Jesus Christ? Peter said, Jesus, I'll go to prison for you. I'll even die. For you, we know what happened. Shortly after that, he's denying Jesus not once, not twice, but three times, even cursing to make it sound more convincing. Now, fortunately, he repented of that, and fortunately, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ forgave him. And fortunately, shortly after that, around 50 days after that, he preaches on the day of Pentecost. Over 3,000 people are converted. Now, God can forgive anyone who has a, a moment, if you will, who has a moment of even denying him. I can't, I can't think of anything worse than that. So God can forgive someone in that category, but I don't ever want to find myself in a position whereby I'm ashamed of my God. Do you? So we need to ask ourselves a question. Are we proudly standing for our God? Are we identifying with him? We are people of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So notice what Moses does here. He calls the people to identification. But I want you to notice, secondly, he calls them to separation. Okay, look at verse 26. The Bible reads in chapter 32 and verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? All right? So he's talking to these people. Uh, they have been worshiping the idol. He says, Okay, Who's on the Lord's side? Then notice what he says next. He says in verse 26, let him come unto me. All right? Who's on the Lord's side? If you're on the Lord's side, come over here. Separate yourself from the idol worshipers. I love that. You know, God expects us to separate ourselves. Yes. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, in his law doth he meditate day and night. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1. Remember what God told Sodom? Sodom, or rather Lot, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom, and he ended up living in Sodom, and he ended up enjoying that cesspool of iniquity. God said, come out, come out. What do we learn in the New Testament? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, God says, be not unequally yoked. He goes on to say, What concord hath Christ with Belial and light with darkness and so forth? And then he says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, thus saith the Lord. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, is of the world. The world passeth away, the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. God expects us to separate ourselves from this world system. What does that mean? What does it not mean? We're not talking about living a monkish existence. We're not talking about living in isolation. That's not what we're saying. How can we influence anyone if we're living in isolation, if we're living a monkish existence? Jesus did not do that. Jesus was called a friend of... Sinners, right? Remember the religious leaders and the accusations of the religious leaders? Look at Jesus over there. He's over there eating with those sinners, right? So we're not talking about removing ourselves from everyone and isolating ourselves. So what do we mean when we talk about separation? What do we mean? Now, I grew up in an environment, my tradition growing up, 
uh, was very legalistic, even my educational training, and I, I believe that I was taught some things that were unhealthy concerning separation. But what is a balanced, healthy approach toward this teaching of separation in Scripture? Come out from among them. Be ye separate, thus saith the Lord. Let's just begin, let's just begin with an understanding that we as believers, there should be a difference in our lives. Don't you think we should be different than those who do not know God? Shouldn't there be a difference in our lives? Shouldn't we be different than this world system in which we live? So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it in a practical way, okay? How do we separate ourselves? First of all, this separation from the world system should be reflected in our actions. What do we know? We're not to be people of vengeance, right? We're taught in the New Testament, dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, rather give place in the wrath where it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So we as God's people are not to be people of vengeance. So we're talking about how we act. This separation should be manifested in our actions. We are not to be vengeful, vindictive people. And by the way, it should be manifested in the way that we converse with people. Whatever happened to having a civil discussion in our country? Whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to free speech for that matter, right? Whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to be able, uh, whatever happened to being able to sit down and just talk with someone, have a civil discussion, and not necessarily agree on everything, but yet have a civil discussion. Nowadays, far too many people their idea of the civil discussion is you agree with them on everything. And if you don't, if you don't agree with them on everything, well, you're a hate monger. There come, there come the insults, right? The branding. You're a hate monger. You're misogynistic. You're xenophobic. You're racist. Oh, my. People run for the hills. When that is thrown out, you're racist and we're afraid. Dialogue is shut down. We're afraid to say anything. Can I just say to you, you're not going to shut me up with that. You're not. You're not. And I'm, I'm done. I'm done. There was a time in my ministry where I felt like I had to prove to people that I wasn't racist. And I'll give all these illustrations. I'm not going to say that I'm never going to give an illustration. But I'm done trying to prove I'm not racist. I know in my heart I'm not. I don't have to prove to anyone. Okay. And so if you want to call me that simply because you disagree with, with me, you go right ahead. But you're not going to shut down my thinking and my opinions and what I have to say. You're just not going to do it. Okay. But far too many people today, that's what's happening to them. Uh, they, they can't handle, they can't handle any type of, of disagreement. That's not to be the way we as God's people act, right? We are God's people. We should be able to differ and differ in a civil way. Have a civil discussion and disagree agreeably. It may surprise you. I know this is going to come as a real shock to the members of this church. But not everyone in this church agrees with the pastor on everything. What's wrong with you, by the way? Why would you not agree with me on everything? You don't know whether to laugh or not, right? It's, it's okay. It's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. That's fine. You know, one of the saddest things I've seen in the body of Christ, I've seen believers not agreeing many times it's over something petty, and then they just wash their hands. I'm leaving this church. I'm breaking fellowship with this believer. I don't want anything to do with this believer simply because there's not an agreement on something in many cases that is petty. I want you to know that's ungodly, and that's not the way that God wants us to live and interact with each other. So this separation should be manifested in our actions. We should not be people of revenge. Our speech should be seasoned with salt. We should be willing to speak the truth in love and listen to other people, even if we don't agree, agree with them, but listen to them without attacking them, or hopefully they'll not attack us. What about uh, this? It should be reflected in our work. You know, there's a problem right now. There's a problem right now with people earning more money through unemployment than going back to their place of business. Did you know that was a problem? Yes. Yeah, that's a problem. Now listen. If your place of business was closed down by the government, I have no issue at all with the government compensating you if the government closed your place of business down. And I don't even care if the guy with the printing press has to work his arm 24-7. You know, we all know that that's what's happening, right? Can you imagine the guy with the printing press up in Austin printing all that money? But nevertheless, uh, that's another subject. I really shouldn't have said that. But nevertheless, uh, the truth is uh, people... If the government shuts your place of business out, I don't have any issue with the government compensating you. But if your place of business has opened up 
As a believer, you should not say, well, I can, I can make more money through unemployment. Hey, wait a minute. Doesn't the scripture say if a man doesn't work, he should not? Right? We're, we're God's people. There should be a difference in our lives, right? We should not just be out for the almighty dollar and, and doing, doing nothing for something, expecting something for doing nothing. No, 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 no. We are God's people. And so what a believer should do is not stay home and draw unemployment, making more money. They need to go back to work and trust God to take care of their needs. You see, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about separation. Separation concerning our actions. Separation concerning our thinking. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to this world. I love that verse because what Paul is saying, do not let this world system squeeze you into its mold. That's what he means. Do not allow the world system to squeeze you into its mold. Far too many of God's people, I'm talking about the body of Christ, far too many of us are allowing this world system to squeeze us into its mold, and this world system is dominating our thinking, the propaganda of the world, the humanism of the world, the indoctrination of the world that's coming from Hollywood, that's coming from the media, that's coming from politicians. Let me say to you, God's people need to think biblically. It's a problem. It's a problem. Because more and more of God's people, they're indoctrinated. They're brainwashed. The culture's brainwashed them. Yeah. And by the way, you know where this propaganda, this, this brainwashing, this indoctrination from the culture, you know where it flows from, right? It flows from Satan's throne, the father of all lies, John chapter 8, verse 44. Is this a problem, Pastor? It's absolutely a problem. This is why more and more of God's people, their thinking is not, is not biblical. Their thinking is not biblical. And they're more and more acceptive of, of homosexuality. Well, 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 wait a minute. Hasn't God spoken about the subject? They're more and more acceptive of abortion. Well, well, what about this circumstance and this situation? Well, well, hey, 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 God's spoken. God's spoken. And we can go on and on with that. God's people are to have biblical thinking. Now listen, for any of us, I know we live in this world and we have to deal with with the cesspool of this world, the iniquity and the indoctrination and the propaganda and the brainwashing, we all have to deal with it. We have to be careful. We have to be on guard. But I'm going to tell you how to wash that filth out of your mind. You want to hear how to wash that filth out of your mind? The Bible says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Bible talks about the washing of water by the word. This word right here, the word of God, will wash away the propaganda of the world the indoctrination of the world, the humanism of the world, which flows from Satan's throne, God's people. We need for our minds to be cleansed by the word of God. Yes. So this separation needs to be reflected in the way we act. This separation needs to be reflected in the way we think. This separation needs to be reflected in the way that we talk. God's people should never use God's name in vain. Amen. Never, only for illustrative purposes, people say Jesus or Jesus Christ or oh my God, right? No, 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 we should not be found doing that. We are not to take the name of our God in vain. By the way, do you hear people taking the name of Buddha in vain? Do you hear people taking the name of Confucius in vain? Do you hear people taking the name of Mohammed in vain? I'm going to tell you something. Satan is not one bit worried about the name of Mohammed, but he hates the name of Jesus because there's power in the name of Jesus. And he hates that name of God's people should never be found using the name of God in vain. What about our speech? Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. We need to be people. Truthfulness, even when that truthfulness brings negative consequences. You know, telling the truth can get you in hot water. Did you know that? But if you tell the truth when you go to bed at night, you can at least put your head on the pillow and know that you've done what God wanted you to do. Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. We are God's people. God expects us to separate ourselves from this world system. The way that we act, the way that we think, the way that we talk. I want you to notice something else. Getting a little more pointed here. Look at verse 29. Moses called the people to consecration. Moses had said, consecrate yourselves. 
today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Now, this was a hard call, consecrated even against their own family members. Think about that. You know, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear that our love for God is to be so strong that it makes every earth relationship appear as hate in comparison. Think about that. In fact, if you read what he said, it's, it's almost hard to read. It's almost as if he's advocating that we should hate our family members, but then you study it out, you understand what he's saying there. He's saying that our love for God should be so strong that it makes every earth relationship appear as hate. What does that look like? You know, the Bible promises special blessings to those who are willing to forsake even their own family members. Think about that. People who are willing to forsake even their own family members. What does that look like? Well, I know of two individuals. One was an evangelist by the name of Hyman Appleman, and the other one was someone from my home church in Alabama. Both of these men were Jewish men. Hyman Appleman passed away years ago. The other man from my home church is still alive today. But do you know that both of these men, when they converted to Christianity, they were raised in strict Jewish homes, steeped in Judaism. So when they converted to Christianity, do you know that their, their parents, their family, disowned them? Now, my friend, God promises a special blessing to anyone who's willing to forsake even his or her own family member for him. In fact... Jesus said, if you're not willing to forsake all, you are not worthy of me. So think about this. Let's talk about this. I've been associated with nine different churches. I've served on five different church staffs. And I'm going to tell you by experiential knowledge, through experiential knowledge that I've gained, we, I'm going to put myself in the category, we as God's people, we fail this test over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I'm going to tell you something. For most Christians, God is not more important than their family members. And they demonstrate this. We as the body of Christ, we demonstrate this over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Now, first of all, when you talk about loving God, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength. Secondly, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I read an illustration years ago. I've used it here many times. Bear with me. I know you've heard me talk about this before. But I want you to, uh, I want you to visualize a clear pitcher of water, and someone drops a quarter down into the clear pitcher of water. It goes to the bottom of the clear pitcher, and it occupies a small part of that pitcher of water, obviously. It's just a quarter at the bottom. And the illustration that I read said that that describes or that, that visualizes the love that most Christians have for God. It's something that occupies a small part of their life. It, it may be a Sunday morning thing, right? It's a Sunday morning thing, but then the rest of the week, God's not really involved in their lives. They're not looking to God for decisions and so forth. He said that describes most believers' love for God. But in fact... Our love for God should be as follows. You drop an alpha seltzer down into that clear future of water and it permeates the entire body. So should our love for God be. Our love for God should influence and impact everything in our lives throughout the entire week. Everything that we say and do, our actions, everything should be influenced by our love for God. So I read that illustration. Boy, you talk about convicting. Because I had to ask myself, do I really love God to that extent? Because we're talking about loving God with every fiber of your being. This is not just a Sunday morning thing, right? Loving God with every fiber of your being. So, with that in mind, thinking about believers failing this test. Say, Pastor, can you, can you demonstrate how we failed this test? Oh, I could talk for hours. I know you wouldn't sit for hours, so I'm not going to put you through all of that, okay? But I, I do want to... I do want to just point out one area where we failed this test. When I was growing up, and I mentioned some of these things Wednesday night in the Bible study. We started the Bible study again Wednesday night. When I was growing up in Alexander City, Alabama, Sunday was a sacred day. We had blue laws. So blue laws, businesses were not allowed to open on Sunday. And get this, when I was a child, Wednesday at noon, the businesses closed down in my hometown. 
I don't know if that was a thing up here, but when I was a child in my hometown, you know why? Wednesday evening, church time. Want to give people time to get home and get everything prepared? Wednesday evening's church time. And in my home church, it was a prayer meeting. That's, that's what we called it, Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Okay, and that's what we did. We gathered together and we prayed. Now, as the years moved on, people weren't as interested in prayer, so we had to add something to that, a Bible study, to make it more interesting so more people would come. And then we had to make it a full-blown service. Yes, I'm just telling you like it is right now. Then we had to make it a full-blown service so that more people would be interested in coming. And now, you know, the Wednesday evening is kind of just fizzled out across the United States. Most churches don't have a Wednesday evening. Um, and the ones that do, about 10%, which is what comes to ours on Wednesday evening, about 10% of the regular attenders come on Wednesday evening. So, with all that said, Sunday was once a sacred day in our nation, wasn't it? It's not that way anymore. And more and more things are encroaching on Sunday. Let's talk about sports. Oh, Pastor, you're not going there. Yeah, I am. I love sports, you know that. I love college football especially, but uh, let's talk about sports. You know what we've done in our nation? We've made a God out of sports. You know, I literally had a man in a previous ministry tell me. He told me. He was bold enough to tell me. I was an associate pastor. Maybe he felt a little more comfortable saying this around me than the senior pastor. I don't know. But he said this to me. He said that when the NFL season starts, I'll not be in church until the NFL season's over. Wow. 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 Now, we may, we may hear that. That's not me, Pastor. That's not me. I, don't, I wouldn't do anything like that. Okay, let's, let's, let me try a little bit more. Okay, let's get down where the rubber meets the road in our lives. Because as, as time has moved on, more and more people uh, have found themselves falling into a trap, I believe. I'm talking about God's people because more and more things are encroaching on the Lord's Day, what we call the Lord's Day, we gather together, and it is a command in Scripture, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. There is no such thing as a committed Christian, someone who's committed to God, who, who neglects assembling as we are today. Now, I understand some people are shut-ins, and some people are sick, and some people can. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who are able-bodied, body, and, and they just they just refuse to make it a priority. I want you to understand no such thing as a committed Christian who refuses to gather with God's people because this is a command, and I don't care how much of the Bible you know, and I don't care how many verses you can quote if you're not part of the local assembly consistently you're disobeying God now with all that said here's what's happened over the years more and more coaches and more and more sports teams have decided to have practices on Sunday and games on Sunday now it's one thing if we're talking a, a tournament or something every blue moon but you know what has happened over the years? God's people have just been falling right in, in line with that. Well, I guess if we have to miss a whole month of church, I guess if we have to miss three months of church, I guess I guess we'll just have to go go along with that because, you know, I want my little Johnny, I want my little Susie, I want them to be involved in sports. They can learn so much through sports. Yes, your children can learn a lot through sports. The last place where I served, last place where I served, we had a large Christian school. We had a full sports program. We had a tackle football team. And I remember preaching in chapel years and years ago, a long time ago, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. And I remember telling those young people, I remember saying to them uh, that for the overwhelming majority of them, their sports career would end the day they graduated from high school. Now, I understood that I had young men listening to me who fashioned themselves to be the next Michael Jordan. So I understood that, and I understood that it was going to go over like a lead balloon. But nevertheless, what I was saying was the truth. It would be interesting to go back about 15 years ago is when I brought that message in chapel. So all those young people that graduated from high school, be interesting to find out how many of them actually went on to college and how many, if any, are actually playing pro ball. You almost statistically, you almost have a greater chance of being struck by lightning than playing sports in high school and going on eventually to play, to play pro sports. So why is it that we put so much emphasis on that? We're not going to, oh, my Johnny, my Susie can't, can't miss that. And even if we have to miss church weeks and weeks on end, even months on end, I'm going to tell you something. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad. I'm telling you the truth right now. Here's what you're saying to your children when you do that. You can tell them that God is first place in your life, but they're not going to believe it. They know. They know. They know that God's not first place. They know that they are. 
their first place, not God. Now, I know it's getting a little quiet here, but I'm telling you the truth right now. If we want revival to come, we're going to have to start putting God in his rightful place. And that includes making this a priority. Now, we're going to talk more about this idea of gathering together as we move on. But I want you to notice God demands total dedication, total allegiance. He wants first place. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. And I want you to notice finally today that Moses called himself personally to intercession. He called himself to intercession. Take your Bible. Look at verses 30 through 32, please. Chapter 32, verses 30 through 32. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, O this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. What is Moses doing? He's standing in the gap. He's praying. He's offering his own soul in the place of the people he loved, just like Paul did, the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 9, verses 1, 2, and 3. There's a statement I'm going to make that's so important. Every time revival has come, it has come through the intercession of God's people. Now, I'm going to be very pointed in the next few minutes. Please, do not get angry. Do not get mad. I tell people, don't get mad. Get motivated, okay? Don't get mad. Get motivated. So Wednesday night, we started the Minor Prophets once again. We're talking about Haggai right now. And Haggai, he's the prophet who went back to Jerusalem after uh, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem. They had been in captivity, Babylonian captivity, for decades. And then the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. And the Persian king Cyrus, 538 B.C., he allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. So they go back. It's been upwards of 70 years since they were in Jerusalem. They go back. It's in ruins. And they start, they're excited about being there. So they start rebuilding the altar so that they can offer sacrifices to God. And then they start working on the, the, the foundation for the temple of God, God's house. But after a period of time, around two years, they just stopped. They stopped completely working on God's house. And they were totally concerned about working on their houses. You know what God did? He sent the prophet Haggai to confront the civil leader, the governor, Zerubbabel. And the religious leader, Joshua. And here's what God was saying to the prophet Haggai, to those men, and ultimately to the people. God's priorities are no longer your priorities. And he's not happy about it. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been under such conviction lately as I'm thinking about revival because... More and more, I'm understanding that all we're doing is saying we want revival to come, but we don't mean it. We don't. You know why? Because if we meant it, God's priorities would be our priorities. Say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Okay, one of those things I mentioned just a moment ago, gathering together. Once again, I understand that people are sick, and right now the virus, some people may not feel comfortable. I understand all that. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about so many of God's people. I've seen it over the years. This idea of worship is just not a priority. Let me ask you a question. Here's the question, okay? Are you ready for the question? Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't comment. But I wonder how many people in this room, I wonder how many of us actually took time individually this week to worship God. You know, I spent a lot of time in the youth building out there, not on top, inside the youth building. And so there's cameras out there now. Brother Rick Love had installed cameras all the way around the building, including out there. But I didn't want cameras back there where I do my preparation, my study, and all that type of thing. I pray. I do all kinds of things in there. I didn't want cameras. And I know when I told Rick about that, he probably thought, well, you don't want people to see you playing pool and video games and all that type of thing. But that really had nothing to do with it. I, I, I didn't want you to see me taking down either, but nevertheless. No, I, no, no, it didn't have anything to do with it because I do a lot of things out there. I do a lot of study, a lot of prep. I do a lot of praying. I walk around, I pray. I do almost all my praying standing up. I'm not a person who can sit down. I get sleepy very easily. So I stand up, I pray. And a lot of times, sometimes even between uh, prep work, I'm out there, I'm raising my hand. Sometimes I get down on my face. And there's a monitor in that office 
the front office. I don't want someone coming in. Well, there's a pastor on his face over there. Does he need help? We need to run over there and check on him, you know. The truth is, worship is a part, individual worship is a part of my life. It's supposed to be. Now, you don't have to get on your face and all that. I'm not saying you have to do all that. But ladies and gentlemen, ask yourself this question. This past week, have you individually worshipped God? They that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. There needs to be individual worship, and then there needs to be worship gathering together as God's people. Why is this no longer a priority with God's people? Why is it not a priority? We're not going to have revival until God's priorities become our priorities. Hit and miss. You know, I'll tend one week, be gone two weeks, I'll tend three weeks, be gone a month. Friend, this has to become a priority. Not just gathering together, but individual worship. Right? What about prayer? I wonder how many of us in this room spent significant time this week praying. I wonder. Why is it that when a pastor doesn't have to be me, but certainly does apply to me. I wonder why it is that when a pastor calls for a prayer meeting, hardly anyone comes. I wonder why it is that when I say we're going to have a movie night with free pizza, we can easily have over 100 people. But if I say we're going to gather together and pray for our country or pray for our church or pray for revival, I'm fortunate to have 10% of the membership. I wonder why that is. Now, you may say, well, I'm feeling guilty now. I'm going to go next time so the pastor won't think less of me. Hey, let me say something to you. If that's the only reason you're going to come, just stay home. Because that's going to burn up as wood, hay, and stubble. You know why? You know why we should gather together and have prayer meetings? You know why it should be the other way around? There ought to be 90% or more of our people who gather when I call for a prayer meeting. And if we don't start seeing that, we're not going to have revival. You better listen to me. It's not coming. It's not coming. I've been here eight years. Have you ever been to a prayer meeting that I've called? Have you wanted to? Have you seen the importance of that? Once again, this is not about me trying to get you in a headlock and pressure you and you coming so that I don't think less of you. No, 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 that's not what this is about. I want you to come when we have those prayer meetings because God has identified this as a priority. And if we don't make it a priority, the country's gone. The country's gone. Does anybody care? The country's gone. And when everything implodes... And then we're crying out, God, God, where were you? You know what he's going to say? I was there, but you just didn't have time for me. Prayer. God's priorities have to become our priorities. What about the word? You know, something's been happening in the body of Christ for a long time now. A long time now. Don't have time for Sunday school life groups, Wednesday evening. Don't have time for men's Bible studies, ladies' Bible studies. Don't have time for a truth project like our Sunday night uh, that's resuming next week. We don't have time for all that in the body of Christ. And here's what we're saying. God will give you one service, if that, by the way, because the majority of God's people aren't even consistent with that. But God will give you one service, but it better not be for more than one hour. Think about that, 168 hours in a week. What is one hour? Less than 1%? Yay! Aren't we so faithful? Aren't we so committed? Yay! We need to be so proud of ourselves. Yay! 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 Am I making my point? I hope I'm making my point. We're not going to see revival until God's Word becomes a priority in our lives, which includes the preaching and teaching of His Word. Has, has the Bible collected dust on your coffee table all week? Has it collected dust? Have you read His Word this week? Have you studied His Word, memorized His Word, meditated on His Word, internalized His Word? Do you like teaching and preaching of God's Word? Do you hear teaching and preaching? Pastor, oh, I, I can't handle more than one week of you. I mean, that's all I can handle all week, folks. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Isn't that what it says in Scripture? As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that we may grow thereby. What did God? God's people had a hunger for the Word. What did God go 
young people said, I want to hear preaching of God's word. I want to hear teaching of God's word. I want to read it. I want to study it. I want to memorize it. I want to meditate upon it. I want to internalize it. I want to live it out. If we don't start doing that, the country's going. We can talk about revival all we want. Revival's not coming. So once again, God's priorities. Are they our priorities? What about sharing Christ? You know, I can do that up here. I can do that through the Iwana program. I can do that at weddings and funerals. You may say, well, Pastor, I'm not a, I'm not a speaker like you. All of us can be involved, though. We can pass out tracts, right? Certainly, we can support missionaries. That shouldn't be the only thing that we do. But we can support missionaries who are taking the gospel around the world. It's time that God's priorities become our priorities. The worship of our God, prayer, the Bible, sharing Christ. I'm going to tell you something. Talks cheap from this pastor. Talks cheap from you as well. So I can just say I want revival. That doesn't mean anything unless I'm willing to make God's priorities my priorities. So you, you might as well just stop saying you want revival unless... You're willing to make God's priorities your priorities. God, God does say this. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, right? Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I know people say, well, that's an Old Testament promise to Israel. I understand that, but I certainly believe there's a New Testament application. I believe that God is looking for us as his people to be serious about him, the worship of our God, and prayer, and the Bible, and the proclamation of the gospel. So the revival of God's people comes through intercession and godly leadership that calls people to separate themselves unto holiness. You know what we all need to do? You know what I need to do? I need to look in the mirror and evaluate myself. Same thing for you. We need to ask ourselves, are we identifying with our God? We need to ask ourselves, are we separating ourselves from this world system? We need to ask ourselves, are we consecrating ourselves? Is God more important to us than anyone or anything else? We need to ask ourselves, are we willing to pay the price? Crying out to our God. Interceding. Interceding. Crying out to our God. Making his priorities our priorities. Then and only then will revival come. You want me to tell you when revival will come? Revival will come when the pastor calls for a prayer meeting and over 90% of the congregation is there and willing to cry out to God. That's when revival is going to come. That's when it's going to come. We don't have anyone to blame but ourselves, folks. Revival is for God's people and judgment must begin where? The house of God. Please stand every head bowed and every eye closed. Invitation is going to be a little bit different today. Here's what I want to ask you right now. Here's what I want to ask you. And we've talked a lot today. This has been a very pointed message about identifying ourselves with God and separating ourselves from this world system and consecrating ourselves and making sure that God is first place in our lives and interceding and God's priorities becoming our priorities. But I hope that you've identified something in your life right now that needs to change. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to identify something that needs to change. Don't let this message go in one ear and out the other ear, folks. I'm telling you, I'm crying out to you as a New Testament prophet, if you will, someone who is telling forth the word of God, crying out to you and saying, we have to put some things into action in our lives if we want revival to come. Just this week, yesterday, and actually on the way to church, I asked my wife about joining me in doing something in our own lives. Uh, that would be a demonstration that we want revival to come. We're not simply going to talk about it. We want, we genuinely, desperately want revival to come. So what have you identified in your life that needs to change? I want you, right where you are, just to speak to the Lord and say, Lord, this is what needs to change in my life. This is what is going to change in my life. 
And here's what I'm going to do as your servant, God. Here's what I'm going to do in reference to revival. I'm not simply going to talk about revival. I'm going to actually commit myself and put some things into practice in my life that demonstrates I genuinely want revival to come. So if you're doing that right now, I'm not looking around. I'm not asking for anyone to look around. In fact, I would, I would want all of us to have our eyes closed. And, but if you're doing that right now to God, you're identifying something that needs to change in your life, something that will change in your life. Why don't you just lift your hand to him? No one's looking. I'm not looking. This is between you and him. I don't need to know. This is between you and God. So you lift your hand to him and say, Lord, this is what needs to change in my life. This is what's going to change in my life for your honor and for your glory because I genuinely want revival to come. Just a moment, Dwayne is going to sing a song. If God has spoken to your heart and perhaps you want to come and seal that decision right here at this altar, just kneel down and say, Lord, I commit myself to you in this area, in this arena in my life. I'm going to demonstrate that I genuinely want revival to come. As soon as Dwayne begins to sing, why don't you step out if God has spoken to your heart? seriously what was said today and help us to genuinely give ourselves to this matter of revival. We need individual revival. We need our church to have revival. We need our nation to have revival. And I pray that that might come to fruition. May it begin with me and spread throughout our church, throughout churches all over the country. God, work as only you can in a mighty way. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Just a few more things here before we end the service. I need to meet with anyone interested in working in Awana this year. We're not sure if we're going to be able to have Awana um, because we have some people who work in Awana who at the present time are not comfortable getting out because of the virus and mixing and mingling. Folks, this is a ministry we want to continue because this is all about getting the gospel to boys and girls. I love, I love the motto of of Awana, reaching boys and girls with the gospel of Jesus Christ, training them to serve him. So we, we want to continue this, but we need more workers. If you're willing to help, and those who helped last year, you're planning perhaps on helping this year, meet me over here, very brief meeting. I promise you it'll be a very brief meeting. I just have something I want to say to you. But if you can help, that would be greatly appreciated because we want to have the Awana program. I know that we're living in difficult times right now, different times, and perhaps we're not able to do uh, everything that we want to do, but certainly I want us to have the Awana program. I know that's my wife's desire as well. So really, really need your help and see, see me after the service. Just meet over here for a few minutes if you can help with that. Also, special church conference. The vote will be taken after the service on Sunday, August the 9th to expend money out of our missions surplus to help our missionaries. And then uh, we have major reports available on the information desk in the front lobby. Please stop by and pick one up. There's a major report 
on the front desk that will uh, let you know how we're doing financially. We're doing well. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving. And it's a little bit different this year. We're doing our, our reports a little bit uh, different. So if you have any questions, you can see me or any of the deacons about that. And uh, also, the Truth Project resumes next Sunday night. I hope that you'll be able to come out to that. Six o'clock, we'll have the Truth Project. There's one final thing I want to do today. Is Miss Edie in the room? Miss Edie, there she is right there. Miss Edie uh, told me, I don't know, four or six weeks ago that, that uh, she would be leaving our church and moving uh, down to Southern Illinois. And uh, she's a very humble lady and she didn't want me to make it known until today. I know that some of you uh, know about it, but she didn't want me to make it public until today. But uh, she's a humble lady and I, I know right now, I feel a little awkward because I know she wouldn't want me to make a big to-do about her, but I'm sorry, Edie, there's just some things I have to, I have to say. I think Edie's one of the sweetest Christian ladies I've ever known. I mean that. And she's given her heart here to the children in Awana. She's given her heart to the young people over in that youth building. And, uh, and I just want you to know, Edie, that all, of the, all that you've done here for the young people has not gone unnoticed. We want you to know that we love you and we appreciate all that you've done. Let's give her a hand. The young people wanted to do something for you. Yes, so Naomi, come right up here. And I've already told Naomi that this is a little heavy. Here's something we have. There we go. Got it? <laughs> I told her it was going to be a little heavy. So this is from the young people of our church. We want you to know as a church, and they want you to know. They appreciate you. It's hard saying goodbye to people, and especially people who've really invested themselves in the ministry of the church where I've served. So I know that my wife shares the same sentiments as me and other people in this room, especially those. Uh, with teenagers, with young people that he has worked with. And I just want you to know, we wish you the best. I tried to keep her here. She knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but it's time for her to move on and uh, down to Southern Illinois. She's retired from teaching. So we're not gonna have a receiving line up front because of concerns about the virus and so forth. And uh, we're not gonna do that. But what I'd like to do at this time is uh, all of us who are appreciative of Edie and her time here, instead of having a receiving line, let's just all stand and embarrass her and just clap our hands. <laughs> well, sometimes I'm just an emotional mess, right? But uh, we, we deeply care about you and we wish God's best for you, okay? So, Brother Ed, why don't you pray a special blessing upon Edie at this time. If I could get this microphone here, you know how to turn it on. Why don't you just pray a special blessing upon her at this time? Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the time that Edie has invested here while at the Bible Baptist Church. We know she has a heart for you and a, uh, a love for you that shows over to the many uh, children and young people that she has uh, instructed over this uh, many years that she's been here. We pray as she heads to Southern Illinois to, uh, to uh, retire, that she just would be with her if it be your will that she would even find a church that she can serve you as well down there. Again, we're going to miss you so much, Edie. We just thank you again so much for all the time you put in and your love of the Lord. And we just thank you as you leave. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more. That was God. Thank you. All right. Well, 
The moral of the story, folks, is just stay here. You don't want to see the pastor crying, do you? Just stay right here, all right? But I understand people move on and uh, life moves on. Thank you so much for coming today. And we're going to have a word of prayer and be dismissed. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we've had to gather together as your people. And bless us now as we're going separate ways. For us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Those who can help with the water, meet right over here, please.